I'm honored to be here. Thank you for letting me come. All the people who made this possible, what a great evening it is. And um, Danny and uh, Ted and Marietta and the team that to put together this um, event have uh, done a wonderful job. What I've been asked to do, and it's good to see you, uh, Dr. Kesselberry, here in this country, uh, Norway. Norway is a wonderful place. Um, but it's remarkable, sometimes the ministry that we do is so important where we are. Uh, we sometimes feel necessary, and I have had the privilege of going to a lot of places around the world and trying to get people into the kingdom of God. Uh, but sometimes our most challenging work is right here, right now, at this place. And so I'm here to talk about eternity tonight, and it's a pleasure to do it. Uh, it involves this book, uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven which is a book I wrote so I would never have to talk about it. That has not gone well at all. Uh, Monday, I'll be in Nashville working on the movie 90 Minutes in Heaven. We waited a little while to do this so that Brad Pitt will become available to play me. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I tell people sometimes it's going to be Gabby Hayes. And if you're, if you're old, you know who that is. It's an old whiskered actor, so probably not Gabby Hayes because I think he's gone to be with Jesus himself. But uh, it's stunning, the response to the book. I wrote the book uh, 10 years ago. This, this copy that you actually have is the 10th anniversary edition of this book. It has a lot more material in it than the original book. Uh, we kind of brought it up to date 10 years since the book came out. And that's what I want to talk about uh, this evening. It's a testimony. And I want to say this. Um, if you're a if you're an, an authentic follower of Jesus, you have a testimony. And, and I, I want to share this hoping that you'll be motivated to share yours. Uh, because it may be the very thing someone needs to hear. I mean, I love preaching. I love teaching. I love doing a lot of things. But, you know, your testimony, a student, a faculty, um, a supporter of the university, your testimony may be the very thing that someone needs to hear. So I'm going to share mine um, with that in mind. A lady walked up to me with this book not long ago, and the book was in terrible shape. It was torn, very dirty. I almost commented on the condition of the book, and I, I didn't. She handed it to me to sign, and I signed the book as I was signing it. I, I, I almost wanted to say, why is the book so, so tattered? And she said, this book belonged to my daughter. I did not know she owned it. It was in her backpack when she got off the school bus and was run over and killed. I said, this, this book was your daughter's book. Yes. I said, was your daughter a follower of Jesus? Yes. She said, my daughter was very devoted to Jesus. She was a, she was a, a great inspiration to me. And I said, well, I'm sorry for your temporary separation from your little girl. It's real, but it won't last. She said, yes, I, I, I couldn't quite bring myself to read, read your book for a while. And, and finally, I picked it up. And as I picked it up and I began to read it, I realized that my daughter had written a lot of things in your book, like in the margins. She had underlined things. She drew circles around things. She drew arrows to things that she obviously thought was important. And after reading your book, Mr. Piper, I realized that I was not ready to go to heaven. And so I gave my heart to Jesus. I know where I'm going now. Do you? Well, I... I usually say this everywhere I go, no matter what the circumstances are. We're taking reservations tonight. That's what the university is about, you know, education. But part of education, I think, frankly, the most important part is helping people prepare for eternity. Not just this life, but eternity. And that's what Jesus is about. Who better than a carpenter king to build us a better place? Well, I went to the place. I, I wasn't planning to die that day, but thank God I was ready when I did. Jesus understands this himself. Uh, he, he experienced death, and we know that story. But what we may not think about was how he prepared for his followers because he knew he was about to leave. So he had some words, and I think they're worth sharing. They're in John chapter 14, because there may be somebody here tonight, altogether possible, who's going through a really difficult time right now. With a crowd this size, I'm sure there are. So here's some encouraged words from all of us, from Jesus, about how to live on the way to heaven. We have a Savior that not only gave us a 
a better place, but he told us how to live on the way to the place. I, I wrote a, another book called Heaven is, Heaven is Real, Lessons on Earthly Joy. And it's a book about how to live on the way to heaven, especially if you've been knocked down and you've had a tragedy and you've gone through a disaster or pain. And it's based on the premise that if you know where you're going, shouldn't you be having a better trip on the way? Well, Jesus prepared them by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Then believe in me also. In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you will be also, and you know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. After all, he told them repeatedly, but they weren't paying any attention. They really didn't want him to leave. And we know that because Thomas stood up and said, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know how to get there which is what the world is really asking, isn't it? How do I, is heaven a real place? Can I really go there? Jesus responds with these words. Sure, you can go there. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man goes to the Father or comes to the Father except through me. And I learned this the hard way because I got killed on the way to church. I was at a pastor's conference in East Texas 25 years ago. Left the conference that morning. I'm headed to my church south of Houston, a small town called Alvin. I did not make it. I was crossing a bridge just about 10 minutes out of the conference center gates, and an 18-wheeler just crossed the center stripe on that narrow two-lane bridge and hit my car head on. He just ran over the car like it was a speed bump, crushed it, shoved it against the railing of the bridge, struck a couple of other vehicles, and it's a horrible wreck on a bridge called the Trinity River Bridge, and it took a long time for police and ambulances to arrive. It's a very isolated area. They did. They started doing what they do very well, which is save lives and rescue people. And uh, they discovered miraculously that, the, that no one else was hurt in the accident, which is incredible if you saw the wreckage. So those people were treated and released, the driver of the truck, the drivers of the other two cars. So it meant that something kind of very extraordinary happened. Four paramedics are now working on me because it's very obvious I'm not okay. And we're eating dinner, so I'm not going to go into really graphic detail about what happened. Trust me, it was horrific. I have been dismembered. So they're waiting for the coroner. The, the body's covered up with the tarp, so nobody will have to see it. It's gruesome. And they're waiting for a coroner and uh, having trouble getting him out to the bridge because there were apparently several other accidents in the county that day. So traffic starts backing up for miles on both ends of this bridge. Behind me are lots of other pastors because this is a pastor's coverage. We just left, and they're behind me. They're trying to get to their churches to lead Wednesday night Bible studies, and they're not going anywhere now. One of them walked up the bridge, saw this carnage, and he says to the policeman, he just felt God speaking to him, and he said to the policeman in charge, Officer, I see there's been a terrible wreck here. I'd like to pray for the victims. And the policeman said, well, that's very nice, but no one, there's, there's no one to pray for. Everyone else is okay. The truck, truck, truck driver, the other two drivers, the man in the red car is dead. He did not make it. That would have been me. But when he said that, God spoke to the preacher, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, I want a preacher that God speaks to, and I want, I think we all need one, don't we? Well, he, he speaks to this preacher and says, pray for the man in the red car. That would have been me. So by faith... He gets in the car and prays over my dead body. Now, he had to really do some wrangling to get that done because they didn't want him to get near the car. They were afraid he'd be a, a, an injured person because it's twisted metal, broken glass. I think God's doing a lot more speaking than we are listening. But he was speaking that day on the bridge, and this guy was listening. So he gets in the car over the body, examines me, and discovers that the only thing I did not break in the accident was my right arm. That is the only thing I didn't break in the accident. My son used to travel with me all the time. He said I didn't break my right arm so I could sign books, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> Maybe. Pastor Dick Allen Raker puts his hand on my right shoulder under the same tarp that I'm covered up with. He begins to pray for me. He's not the only one praying. By that time, because they did search me to try to find out who I was, when they found my identification, they called my home in a town south of Houston called Friendswood. Well, nobody was at home. My wife was teaching school. My wife, that's why I appreciate uh, educational institutions like this. My wife taught school for 34 years. 
I graded a lot of papers in those 34 years. Thank goodness she gave me the key, I think. So she was at school that day. Uh, she was not at home. She is the hero of the story. I am not. She is the one who took care of our three children. She is the one who kept teaching so we could have some insurance to pay for the $6 million it would cost to put me back together again. She is the one who emptied bedpans and balanced a checkbook. I'm a survivor. She is a hero. Eva has her own book called A Walk Through the Dark. It's a great book for people who are trying to figure out how to get through the dark. Since they couldn't reach her, they called my church. They found my business card in the wallet, told the church I'd been in an accident, but not that I was a fatality because they, they hadn't notified next of kin yet. So the church knows that I've been in a terrible accident on the way to the church, and so they launch into a prayer meeting, and someone has the idea of getting the Houston phone book out and start calling every church on the Houston phone book. That's a lot of churches. Six million people live in the greater Houston area, and it just started spreading over that area to neighboring states, from one end of the country to the other, Washington State to Maine. I've been in both of those places, and I've talked to people who prayed for me that day, still meeting them today. So all these petitions are being lifted up to the throne of God. I don't know if they're praying because I'm at the throne of God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's what the Bible says happens when you are ready to go, and I wasn't planning to go that day, but I was ready, and so there I am, and I'm having the best time. If I'd have known they were praying down here, I would have told them to stop, because if you've been there, you don't want to be here, even Northwest University, so they're all praying, and God is listening. He hears their prayers. Well, this goes on for an hour and a half. And the reason we know this, because the accident happened at 11.45 in the morning, right before noon. It is now 1.15 in the afternoon. The coroner has still not arrived. Traffic's backed up in both directions. Dick Honorecker is under the tarp praying over my dead body, and he has now begun to, he has now begun to alternate verbal prayers with musical prayers. We just heard some musical prayers. And, and his musical prayer was an old hymn called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. He's singing that song over my dead body, holding onto my right shoulder, and suddenly... Without any warning, under that tarp in the dark, as he sang that song, I started singing the song with him. He exited the car briskly. <laughs> and then he did something we probably wouldn't have done. He, he went over to the policeman and said, Officer, the dead man is singing. And nobody believed that. It's unbelievable. Well, I was singing. I do remember singing with him, even if I didn't know who he was. Well, it, it was very difficult to get me out of the car. I mean, the equipment was for removing a living person was not even on the site. Had to be ordered from 35 miles away. It arrived. I was extricated and taken to a series of hospitals. I say a series because my injuries were so extensive that the first two hospitals they took me to could not handle my kind of catastrophic injuries. I had brain damage as a result of my head being crushed. My wife still thinks I have brain damage, and that works out pretty well sometimes. I tell people before the accident I was a genius, and this is all I got left now. <laughs> I was impaled on the steering wheel, so I had internal injuries that would have been life-threatening. Had I lived, I should have been vegetative. The dashboard collapsed on both of my legs, severing my left leg just above the knee. Four inches of femur was ejected from the car and never found. My right leg was broken exactly at the knee. I put my arm up when the truck was coming for me, and at that moment, the truck ran over me and took my arm into the back seat of the car and from here forward was lying on the back seat of the car. I told I would never walk again if I lived and if they were able to reattach this arm, it would just hang by my side for the rest of my life. I finally arrived at a level one trauma center in Houston, 85 miles away from the second hospital. From an accident that happened at 11.45, I arrived at 6.15 that evening and I would be in a hospital bed from that moment forward for 13 months and have 34 operations to try to reassemble me from head to toe. So I, here are a couple of things I think we could take with us tonight. Number one, I believe that God answers prayer. And number two, I believe that God is still in the miracle business today. That's just as true for this generation of students as it was and is for you who have been students a long time ago. Still learning those kinds of things. I think they're worth reminding us of. I am an answered prayer. I didn't have anything to do with my survival. If I had a choice, I would have stayed there. But these people were 
pleading with God on my behalf. They're just pleading with God to let me live. Uh, many of them didn't even know who I was, but they were pleading and God said yes. In that same discourse in John chapter 14 where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, he says this, if you ask it in my name, I will do it. Now, I don't know how you get any more direct than that. These people were praying. Now, God's not on our schedule. Sometimes we have to get on his. Sometimes the answer to our prayers, frankly, is no. I've lived long enough that I'm glad God answered some of my prayers. No. But I got what I asked for. It was a disaster. But here's what I've discovered. God is able to answer our prayers so far beyond even what we're asking for. These people were just asking for me to live. And I walked up on the stage, and when I finished, I'm walking off. I on my own two legs. This is that arm that was in the back seat of the car that they said would never work again. So I believe that God answers prayer. I am an answer to prayer. And that applies to you personally. That applies to the students. That applies. Now, it doesn't mean you can wait to the last minute to study for your algebra test and, you know, get an A on it, unless you were pretty good already. I mean, that's presumptuous. So if you ask in my name, he said, in my name means that it's in accordance with his will. He is able and willing and can do it, and he certainly did it for me. I'm here because a lot of people prayed, and God said yes. I was speaking at a banquet like this in Houston not long ago, and a guy got a phone call at one of the tables, and he kind of looked, he kind of rocked back in his seat when he saw the, the screen on his phone. I thought he would leave. He did not. He stayed afterwards and came up to me in the parking lot and said, I guess you wonder what happened. I said, yes, I almost asked you in the meeting, what, is everything okay? And he said, yes, everything's fine. My best friend, who I've known since we were little boys together, lives in Louisiana. I live in Texas, he said, and, and uh, he has three children. I have three children. I was his best man. He was my best man, and we love our kids, and we've been praying for them since they were born, really before they were born. That, that at an early and understanding age, they would give their hearts to Jesus. And my three children have, and his two youngest have, but not his oldest, who's a fine, fine young man, a delightful young man. He's 21. And tonight, as you were saying, keep praying, never give up. God answers prayer. At that very moment, my best friend called me to tell me his son had just given his heart to Jesus. You tell people that, that God answers prayer. I know I am one. I did have a lot of miraculous things to happen to me. We don't really have time to go into the night. But in that same discourse, Jesus makes this statement. Now, this is John chapter 13. You can look it up. He says to these guys who had followed him around now for three and a half years, they saw him change water into wine. They saw him give sight to the blind. They saw him make the lame walk. They saw him stand outside the tomb and say, Lazarus, come forth. They saw this. And he says to them, after I leave here, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing and even do even greater things than these. Anyone. Notice the word anyone. He's not just talking to the guys that are in the upper room that night. He's talking to us. I, I think God's doing some of his best stuff now. A lady walked up with this book, again, not long ago, a different lady. She was about 60, and I was in a church speaking, and then I sat down to sign some books. She walked up with the, the book, clutching her chest like this. She was holding it very tight. She looked down at me and she did not say hello or nice to meet you or anything. Her first words were, you sent me this book in jail. I said, yes, ma'am. We send a lot of books to people who are incarcerated. All they have to do is ask. She said, it changed my life. I was in for my fifth DWI. They had taken away my license. I couldn't do any more community service. I was out of options. So as a 60-year-old woman, I was in jail for a long time. But I read your book. I, I knew I needed something. I knew I couldn't go on the way. Like you, after you got hit by the truck, you knew you were never going to be the same again. You had to find a new normal. I did too. And my new normal is to overcome this addiction, is to get over this addiction. And that's what I've done. And I'm asking you to pray for me because two weeks from tonight in this very church, in this very room, I'm going to start teaching Celebrate Recovery to Addicts. Please say a prayer for me. I said, yes, ma'am, we'll do it right now. I think that's a miracle. I think God's doing some of his best stuff today. You know, all these students, I think they're miracles. 
I mean, didn't you feel that way about your child when you, in the first, you know, when you held them the first time? You knew they were a gift from God. I think that's what you are. I think you're all stewards of these young people. Someone was a steward for you, and it's our turn. They're a miracle. They represent so much. I'm so honored to have my children. My wife and I have three children, and we have two grandchildren. Actually, if you don't believe in miracles, consider that a son-in-law who's not worthy to marry your daughter could be the father of the most beautiful grandchildren ever born. <laughs> Is that not a miracle? Of course, my mother-in-law felt the same way about me, but uh, I think that's a miracle. I think God's doing some of his best stuff today. I think if God can resuscitate a dead man in a red car, he could put marriages back together again. He can help people overcome addictions. He can help people make peace with their past. I was uh, speaking in Virginia, and I was in a book signing line, and down the line were some people crying, I mean really crying, before they ever got to the table. I have a lot of crying at my book signing tables, but not before they get there. Well, when they arrived, I, I found out that all these people who were crying were parents of Virginia Tech students who had been murdered on the campus. And they came to tell me that they had read the book and they knew they had to find a new normal. And so their new normal consisted of starting scholarships in the names of all their children for kids who would never be able to go to school otherwise. And that was their new normal. I think we can do that. I think that's a miracle. I also think it's a new normal. I, I had to find one because I was never going to be the way I was before. But I have been knocked down I haven't been knocked out. 13 months in a hospital bed. Um, I ended up having a, a device applied to me. You may have seen them. An external fixator, a bone stretching device on my left leg, first one ever applied in this country. Since I was missing four and a half inches of femur, this involves putting halos around your leg and embedding the wires through your leg and then breaking the leg in another place and turning screws on those halos four times a day to stretch the bones inside hoping that the bone will eventually be replaced. It's a nightmare, really. 32 open wounds in my leg for a year. They put one on my arm, too. They didn't have to stretch the bones. They can actually replace bones in the arm because you have two much smaller bones. They actually took the bones out of my right pelvis and put them in my arm. All the skin on this arm, since I didn't have any left, was removed from my right leg and put on this arm. Medical people have a wonderful knack for finding things you didn't even hurt and hurt that for you to fix the other stuff. <laughs> so I'm lying in the hospital bed on the 21st floor of St. Luke's Medical Tower in Houston, and I'm not doing very well. I'm infected. I'm wearing a device that no one's ever worn before. I've hit the bottom. One good thing can happen when you hit the bottom push off. I'm shaking my fist at God. You say, well, that's pretty dangerous. No, no, it isn't. I mean, God would rather us be angry at him than ignore him. And I, I was really struggling that night, not so much because I was angry, because I was frustrated. And here's what I wanted. And maybe you can identify with this. Can't you send someone here who understands what this is like? If I could just talk to somebody who gets it, I think I could probably be okay. I'm listening to some Christian music, some like we've just heard tonight, and God spoke to me to the music, and here's what he said. This is not about you, son. You're having the biggest pity party in the history of the world, and I was. He said, you need to turn your test into a testimony. Take your mess and make a message that's going to bless someone else. Take the pain and find a purpose. You need to find a new normal because you're not going to do the things the way you used to do them. You can't. Physically impossible. But you don't have to be bitter you can be better. Let me help you. I understand how you feel. You see the difference? I, lo I lost my wife, you know. I I'm wondering, do you know what that's like? Yeah, maybe you lost yours too. Can't you put your arm around someone else and say, I understand how you feel? Something we can all do. I think that's eternal. I think when we're talking about living for eternity, I think I think that's what that means. It means making a difference now in the lives of people who are really going through a long, dark night. It's amazing how people have appropriated this story, 90 Minutes in Heaven, to their situation. To me, in me, I, I just have trouble seeing it. I don't know what it is they read about this that connected with them, but it just seems to happen over and over and over again because people want to find somebody who understands. 
how they feel. And I want to suggest this to you tonight. You can do that. I'm beaten up, but I'm not beaten. And neither are you. And, and you know what? It may have to be vicarious. You may have to do it through something else, like scholarship. It may be something you can't actually physically do. You can't go up and teach. The professors can handle that. But what you can do is have a part in the university. And you can make a difference. Because you know what? The people who greeted me at the gates of heaven were people that helped me get there. Yeah, when the truck struck me, I was standing at the gates of heaven just, just like that. I, I took my last breath on the bridge and my next breath at the gates. There are 12 gates in heaven. Three on each side of the great city. And I'm standing at one of those gates and it was just amazing. It was just awesome. It, was, it was, looked like the inside of an oyster. It was a gate made of pearl. It was dazzling, brilliant. Because of the light reflecting off the gate, there's no sun or moon in heaven. They don't need either one of them. God illuminates heaven with his majesty and glory. And Jesus actually receives an additional name in heaven. He's called the lamp of glory. He's called the lamp of God. Lamp, L-A-M-P. So you bask in that glow and it's reflecting off the gate. I'm kind of digesting this magnificent gate and I'm panning down and I'm looking to my grandfather's face. I had been with him when he died. My grandfather, I'm the first person in my, life, in my family on any side, in any way, who ever was privileged to go to college and get a degree. My grandfather was illiterate, really. I found out when I was 13 because I was signing an order of wood for him. He was a carpenter, and he said he didn't have his glasses. And I told my mother, and she said, I thought you knew, honey. Papa can't read or write. He was born before the Depression. He went to work when he was seven years old to eat. But he could take lumber and nails and build places like this. I thought he was a genius. I wanted to be like him. I'm still trying to be like him. One night he sat down on the bed beside my grandmother and died. I got a lot of broken bones, but nothing hurts like a broken heart. And I adored him, and then he died. Last time I saw him, he was in a casket at his funeral. Now I'm standing at the gates of heaven, and there he is to meet me. He knew I was coming. You're not going to sneak up on heaven. Everybody knows who's coming. You know, one of the questions I get asked often is, do people in heaven miss us? No, they don't miss us. They expect us. There's no time in heaven. Every time someone makes a decision here to go there, they have a big celebration in heaven. They write your name in a registration book up there called the Lamb's Book of Life. You want your name in this book. And so they were expecting me that day. I did not sneak up on heaven. These people were all there to greet me because they knew I was coming. There's no time in heaven. It's eternal. Here we are talking about living for eternity. It is the eternal place, and so they were waiting. I know they just arrived themselves in a heavenly sense, and they pivoted, and I was right behind them. What a glorious reunion it was. My great-grandmother was standing beside my grandfather. I called him Papa. My grandfather had lost three fingers on one hand and two and a half fingers on the other, so all the really hard labor he had done in his life, I was fascinated by that. And at the gates of heaven, he spoke a language I've never heard before, but fully understood, extended his hands and said, Welcome home, Donnie. That's what he called me here on earth. And I looked down at the hands that had held me when I was a little boy, and all of his fingers were there. I had never seen them before. You're going to be perfect in heaven. You're going to look good. I mean, you look good now. <laughs> look around. Don't you look good? But you're going to be perfect in heaven. All those things were missing down here, you'll get them back up there. I had a lady come up not long ago, and she said after a service, she said, we're going to be perfect in heaven. I said, yes, ma'am, we'll be perfect. She says, is there any chance at all I could be a size two? <laughs> and, uh, and she was not a size two. I said, ma'am, I don't know about sizes in heaven, but you will be perfect. She threw her head back and laughed, and she says, I'm going anyway. Are you? Are you sure? You can be sure. You can be. It's about training up a new generation of people to make other people be sure. That's what it's all about. They were all perfect. My great-grandmother was standing beside him, Hattie. She was a victim of osteoporosis. She was about six inches taller or shorter because her, her bones had actually collapsed. She wasn't missing her fingers like my grandfather was. She was missing her teeth. She didn't have any real teeth. She had lost them. She had some dentures. She did not like them. 
She did not wear them often. <laughs> but in heaven, she smiled at me. And it was the first time I ever saw her real smile. And she was a good six inches taller there than she was here. She was perfect. I looked at these people who greeted me, and I thought to myself, what did these people greet me? They didn't even know each other here on earth. What did they have in common? Well, they had a lot of things in common, but two of them really, really stand out, and here they are. Number one, they were all ready to go when the time came. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. You have to be prepared for the place. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. I wasn't planning to die that day. It was a 38-year-old preacher on my way to church to lead a Bible study. Two friends from high school over here that were in my high school graduating class died. One of them was a car crash victim. Another one was a drowning victim. You know, many of you spend your lives around young people that are still in their teens or their early 20s. These two guys died when they were 18. And I must say to you, we were devastated. We were 18-year-olds, and we lost another 18-year-old just like us. What a wake-up call. But they were there to meet me at the gate. They knew I was coming. My great-grandmother was 78. She wasn't planning to have a stroke that day, but my friend Mike, who was 18, and my grandmother, who was 78, were both ready because they'd given their hearts to Christ at a young age. They just weren't planning to die that day. So you've got to be ready. The other thing they had in common is the one I've already alluded to, and here it is. I was greeted by the gates, at the gates of heaven by the people who helped me get to heaven. These are people who physically took me to church when I was a little boy, didn't have any other way to go. These are people who told me about Christ. These are people who, who read me the Bible. These are people who lived the Christian life in front of me so I knew what one was, and they met me at the gates of heaven. Miss Norris was there. She was my next-door neighbor. When I was nine years old, my daddy was in the U.S. Army for 23 years. He fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Authentic American hero. But that many was gone almost all the time. Miss Norris wasn't, my next-door neighbor. She found out I didn't have a way to go to church because my mother didn't have a driver's license. We didn't have a car anyway. She said, you just tell your son to get dressed and stand by the mailbox then, uh, tomorrow morning, and I'll pick him up. She did every Sunday morning. She'd pull up in front of the house and say, would you like, would you like to go to the Lord's house, Donnie? And I'd say, yes, ma'am, I surely would. And she says, get in the car. We're going to church. She met me at the gates of heaven. She deserved to be there because she helped me get there. But I came back from heaven with this question, and I think it's probably the question of this hour. If we greet people at the gates of heaven that we help get there, and I think we will, who are you going to greet? Who's going to be there because of you? Well, we're here tonight talk about a great university that impacts so many lives. Well, that's certainly one way to do it. But as you go in your life, we're here to help everyone else get there. And we have much work to do. At school, at work, your neighborhood, amongst your family members and your friends, I think that's why we're still here. Over the gates, over their heads, I could see through the gate, there's a long boulevard running down the middle of the city. It's a street really made of gold. Gold so pure that it's actually transparent. On both sides, magnificent structures. By any standards that we can talk about here, these would be mansions. You're going to like these a lot. Everybody gets one. And I'm looking at them, but what I really want to do is go down the street and climb the hill because there's a hill in the center of the city, and the brightest light of all is coming from that hill. I mean brilliant. We'd be blinded by it with earthly eyes, but it's brilliant. And I know that's where the Lord is high and lifted up. And I wanted to leave the people who greeted me because I knew they lived there. They would come in after me. I wanted to go through that 28-foot thick gate. I wanted to go down that boulevard, up the hill, and just fall at his feet. The great God of all creation and say, thank you for letting me come. Thank you. But I never got a chance. I did move past the people. I did move through colors I have never seen before. Here, I did move through aromas I have never smelled before here. I did move through angels of all descriptions who I can only hear their voices, which I guess I expected to hear, but I could actually hear their wings. What a comforting, encouraging sound that was. They're the ones who bear us up, and they were there to greet me when I arrived. I'm passing through the angels now, and then I'm experiencing music. Music that was so breathtaking, it's my most vivid memory of heaven. 
thousands of songs at the same time without chaos. All of them glorifying God, for he alone is worthy of our worship. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Worthy is the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Thousands of songs, but all of them fit together. And soaring above all the songs is one song. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Because he is. And we're not. So how did I get into heaven? Because I'm not holy. I got witnesses. I got into heaven because one day, after Miss Norris took me to church, and Mike told me about Jesus, and so did my grandmother, and a lot of other people who greeted me at the gates, I was sitting in church, and the pastor said, who wants to go to heaven? We're taking reservations today. And I knew I wasn't ready, and I knew I wanted to be ready, so I was like in a three-point stance. And they fired the gun, which was the choir start singing, and I left my seat, and I went down, and I took that preacher's hand at a, as a 16-year-old and said, Preacher, I want to go to heaven. And he said, son, this is the best decision you'll ever make. He was right. Two weeks later, I was baptized. And then 22 years later, on a lonely highway in East Texas, I was run over and killed by a truck on the way to church. Thank God I was ready. Just wasn't planning to die that day. Now I'm going in, and I'm merging inside. I'm merging in this... This glorious place. I didn't have a near-death experience. When you're dead an hour and a half, you're not nearly dead. I was there. It is just the most awesome, wonderful, profound, real thing that's ever happened to me. And as I entered through the gates, it all stopped. In a split second, I found myself in darkness and silence. The exact opposite of what I've been experiencing since I arrived in heaven. And I wanted to cry out. I wanted to say, what's going on? I just arrived. I, I just got here. Before I could even say that, I heard a voice. And this time the voice is not in front of me like all of heaven was. It's behind me. It's that preacher in the car on the bridge singing that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and I was back here. And then I lay in a hospital bed for 13 months and had unspeakable surgical procedures and I was told I would never walk again. I lay there in that hospital bed every day, and the two years of therapy and rehabilitation that had followed afterwards. And I asked the same question of God every day, because I was looking up, it's the only direction I could look. Why did you let me see that and take it away from me? And the answer I have tonight here in Bellevue it's so I could speak, I could be here. I tell you to your face, heaven is real. And Jesus is the way. I think that's what living for eternity means. Making a difference now, giving people hope now, and assuring them that there is a better place than this. Heaven is real. Jesus is the way. In the moment the pastor is going to the, the president is going to come and continue this uh, time together tonight. I am deeply honored to have been asked to be here tonight. I believe in Christian education. I believe in the young people of our generation. In some ways they have so much more promise, but they need more tools. They need more resources, and I want to challenge you in that regard. So my prayer for you tonight is if I don't meet you here, and there's a lot of you and there's just one of me, one day I will see all of you at the gates. And may God be with you until that day.